No pressure. I'll just I'll kick off. I'm uh, I'm here from Citizen, the Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. Um, I will not be doing a Gus impression, um, so uh, I just have to leave it to your imagination here. Um, but if he doesn't agree with something, feel free to boo from the uh, peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, Citizen was um, funded by uh, Heritage Lottery Fund uh, from 2015 to, to uh, 2018. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little update about what we've been up to for the last three years. Um, some of these slides you'll probably have seen before, some might be new, so that'll be very exciting. And uh, we do get a lot of crossover with frog volunteers as well as Citizen volunteers, so if you see any of your buddies, just uh, give a shout, or if you see yourself even. <laughs> And um, so, oh, that doesn't work. So, set the scene. Um, a little positive uh, news from after lunch. Sorry, everyone. So, our heritage is under threat um, from wind waves, uh, rising sea levels, tidal scour. Um, as I'm sure we are all um, aware, and a lot of the talks today have covered, actually, and yesterday as well. Um, so, we're um, potentially facing um, a, some drastic sea level rise uh, uh, along the coast here. Um, also, that picture was taken by a citizen archaeologist. I don't know if they did a dynamic risk assessment uh, before that one was taken, um, but we'll just move swiftly on from that. Uh, but that means our heritage is potentially washing away, sometimes before it's even seen. Um, so same thing uh, with the Thames Discovery Program. It's all about monitoring and seeing what um, is revealed um, before, uh, before it's washed away. Again, talking about dynamic risk assessments. Um, don't be these people <laughs> here when this is happening. Um, so because we, uh, there's lots of different types of coastline all around the, um, the country, we get, we get lots of things, different types of things uh, to look at. So I'll give you guys a bit of a whirlwind tour, considering we only have about 20 minutes to talk. So <laughs> cover three years and 10,000 kilometers, go. Um, so a uh, quick talk about, especially since the release of the IPCC special report this week, I don't know if you guys have been seeing that on the news recently, but um, uh, talking about global warming and uh, 1.5 degrees um, increase. Uh, so what does that kind of mean for the UK? Uh, well, it's, it isn't just about warming. It's about um, warmer and wetter winters, uh, hotter and drier summers, um, and potential sea level rise and increased storminess. So actually that kind of exacerbates the kinds of things that are sort of natural processes already from living on an island. Um, but that's okay, we'll leave this will get down and we're gonna move on. <laughs> so, um, because uh, it actually can act like an agent of discovery. So these things, because they're um, being uncovered by the waves, um, are suddenly revealed. And that means we get to see them and study them. Um, uh, so there aren't that many of us archeologists uh, based with Citizen, um, but we are based on three different um, offices around the country to better, uh, more quickly reach the coast. Um, so those were our partners for um, Council for British Archaeology up in the, in the north, and York, and I think I see Andy up there. Hello, Andy. <laughs> oh, no. Um, and uh, in London uh, with Museum of London Archaeology, and uh, in the southwest at Portsmouth, um, at the fabulous Fort Cumberland, um, with the Nautical Archaeology Society. Um, so it means we've got a lot of um, excellent partnership working that we can do, especially with um, our amazing partners. Um, we have other partners as well, like National Trust and Crown Estate, who are big landowners along the coast. So that really helps um, gain access uh, to these sites, especially for our volunteers who might otherwise not get to see them. Oop. So I won't tell you everywhere we've been, but check it out. We've been really, really busy. <laughs> it's really exciting. Um, and we try to do um, sort of conservation and monitoring, but it has to be fun um, because otherwise people won't come back. Um, but we uh, develop uh, sort of skills and, and how to recognize archaeology um, and how to record it. Um, but those are also transferable skills. Um, so it kind of helps people get into um, other employment. Um, and we try to raise awareness of this at-risk archaeology. People don't even know sometimes that um, archaeology is on the coast at all, let alone that it's under threat. So those kinds of things are really important for us uh, to raise awareness. Um, loop. So I'll give you, I'll just blind you with science here, give you some numbers. Don't know if you can see it actually because we've got our fabulous prizes in front of it. Um, <laughs> buy a raffle ticket. Um, but uh, kind of main things we do um, are sort of outreach. That's how we raise this awareness of uh, what's on the coast um, and how you can do more. 
So we do sort of guided walks and all sorts of things. Um, and this little table here is just to show you the kinds of things we've been doing over our Heritage Lottery funded period. Um, we have uh, engaged over 9,000 people, um, which is super, um, and they're all fabulous. And, uh, but that's a 1,500% a, a increase of what we thought we would do originally. Um, so it really shows that people are interested and excited and want to come back, um, which is awesome. Uh, same thing with our training. Um, so we do a lot of training courses um, over the weekend usually, um, or some specialist workshops as well. So if anyone's interested in developing their skills, keep an eye on our website. Um, and again, we've done kind of way over our, our percentage of our target we thought we'd do for a Heritage Lottery funded thing. Again, because it was, people were so interested, they kept asking us to do more, um, which is great. Everyone loves a pie chart, I think. I do. <laughs> I do, so I'm putting one in. <laughs> so this is kind of what we've been up to. Um, and it's just to show you again uh, that our outreach is actually two thirds of what we do and it's uh, one third training. So it's more just about um, raising, yeah, raising awareness of what this uh, archeology span is. And I'll stop talking about that because we haven't get to see what it is, hooray. Um, so here's stuff, the kind of stuff we get to see along the coast. So unlike um, a lot of the awesome stuff you get to see in an urban environment on the Thames foreshore, um, you get to see all sorts of different kinds of things like uh, shipwrecks of wooden uh, vessels, uh, like the Kunato here. I don't know if you can see its ribs sticking out here, along here, and it here. Um, uh, we see sort of uh, evidence of coastal erosion in action. This is the Hallowood Battery um, in the Isle of Wight. The needles are just behind our fella here with the, uh, the leveling staff. Um, and again, dynamic risk assessments. <laughs> We've got some coastal erosion here. And brave Andy once again uh, tackling coastal erosion single-handedly. <laughs> um, so we get to—it gives you an opportunity to see a section through archaeology without actually having to dig one. So that's quite nice. Um, we look at World War One and two uh, military defenses as well of the uh, coast of uh, England and well Britain whole as a whole uh, was heavily uh, heavily defended uh, in World War One and World War Two uh, against potential uh, invasion threats, including these. Uh, uh, anti-tank blocks here. Um, so this is one of our student placements, um, Henry giving a nice little tour uh, to uh, the CBA. Um, slightly different types of things. I think some of you will have seen this slide last year. Uh, we also look at uh, less typical things that you might think are on the coast, like this atomic weapons research establishment. Um, no live nuclear weapons were tested there. We have been informed, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but we're looking at things like this because it's built on, these temporary buildings are built directly on the shingle. They're very um, uh, at risk from dynamic movements of the coast. Um, so this is a target that was in place, an aerial target that they would use to, to drop bombs on. Um, and there's not much of it left, you can see here. Also that lighthouse isn't gonna be there very long either. So that's another story. Uh, we get something slightly different as well, so it's kind of leisure on the coast. So this is uh, Earl Grey's bathing pools up in uh, Wick, Northumberland. Um, and uh, so they're actually cut into the stone um, and they fill up at high tide with fresh uh, seawater. And if anyone's attempted to um, go uh, sea bathing up in Northumberland uh, with, with big rocky cliffs, danger, danger. But um, this is a bit of a safer environment for um, uh, the Earl Grey's uh, multiple children. I can't remember. Shout it out, Andy. Can you remember how many kids this guy had? Lots. Um, ten? Yeah. So you want to keep those babies safe. <laughs> um, and then they can like play on a sort of beach environment in their own backyard. Uh, but we get to record stuff like this because it is something you don't really think about as being on the coast. It's quite exciting. Other really cool and slightly ephemeral features are um, things like prehistoric footprints. These are found all over the coast. Um, and uh, these were found up in Formby at Merseyside. Um, I told this little laser pointer works, but I don't know how many tracks you can see, but you've got human footprints crisscrossing here, and some others crisscrossing there. Some modern ones there, I don't want to count those. Um, but uh, so these are, um, we are preserved in the laminated silts, and as the um, silts are filled in over time, they, they get pressed down and preserved. So they're only uh, revealed for a few tidal um, cycles, and we have to teach people how to uh, record them quickly because they're only only there for a few days. 
Um, other things, pretty exciting. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Now I have a, finally have an answer to the what's the coolest thing you ever found uh, question. Um, a mammoth tusk in uh, Mersey Island in Essex. Uh, so it's evidence of the Ice Age. So this is found um, over a kilometer offshore on a really super low tide. And we only could find stuff like this because we had loads of volunteers with us all field walking along um, uh, this coast. It's very flat. You guys have been to um, the coast out in Essex. Um, and we only had uh, about half an hour to uh, record this. So and it, it's over two meters long. It's very tiny scale. Um, and uh, weighs an actual ton. So <laughs> we could not actually save it. So what we could do, I know, don't worry, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so what we did is the next best thing. Um, some of our volunteers actually went back the next day and took loads of pictures all around it um, and created a 3D model of it. So it's um, sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, and it's kind of like how Victorians made plaster casts of dinosaur bones in the past. It's the same kind of thing, just in a digital way. Uh, and we took a samples of it as well. So that's being, being looked at uh, at the Natural History Museum. Um, so don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> and it might still be there. It weighs, it weighs a load, so uh, we covered it back up after. Um, we do build a recording as well, so slightly different. This is um, uh, St. Patrick's Chapel up in Hesham uh, in Lancashire. Uh, you can see Morecambe Bay, beautiful Morecambe Bay just behind, and the coast edge right here. <laughs> um, so uh, we decided to update the building recording for that before um, any coastal erosion might take it away. Um, uh, we've done some scientific dating um, because it, you can find sticks in the mud anywhere. We don't know how old they are. So we've been looking at um, some potential trackways up in a peat shelf uh, in Cleethorpes. Uh, so we had a fun day out with um, Historic England last year. Lots of highly visible people. Uh, we do guided dog walks because if you ever find uh, in the newspaper new exciting feature found on the coast, who finds it? Dog walkers, of course. So you want to make sure that they know what they're looking for and that they can recognize when something's important and different. Um, some other exciting stuff, more technology. We do drone surveys, especially in uh, sticky intertidal mud areas. It's very dangerous. You don't want to be walking in there. Um, so we let the drone do the work. This is uh, the um, Hans Egde at Cliff. Um, you can see here that we actually got a nice little model of it. And again, that's measurable. You can survey off of that. Um, and you can take another survey over time and compare the difference and see if it's eroding. In fact, last time we went back, this front half had fallen off. <laughs> so uh, in a big storm. Um, but we would never have been able to um, survey it by hand around the other side without either some serious waders or those like walking on top of mud shoes. Um, and we didn't have either of those. Another cool little one. I think you guys have seen this, this fella before, but just in case, um, this is a brick kiln at Brown Sea Island. It's now in the intertidal zone. Um, if you were building a brick kiln today, you probably would not want to build it uh, in the intertidal zone. So you can sort of see relative sea level uh, differences here. Um, this is it in 2015, and we're doing a quick, quick fire survey. You can see our little baseline tape here. Um, keep an eye on this arch because the next year, it's not just the sea, but it's also the vegetation that is affecting these structures. Um, so uh, luckily, we had taken a 3D model of it the year before. So we captured where every single brick was, and we didn't have to draw them by hand. <laughs> Uh, and then we, we took another 3D model each year, and we can compare the rate of loss over time and let the computer sort of do the, do the math for us. So it tells us how much things have changed. Um, I'll give you a quick little example of some of the stuff we do um, that we can kind of contribute to the climate change discussion. Again, we, like I was saying before, it's really important um, that our observations are sort of taken seriously by other people. Um, we can talk about past and modern sea level rise, especially through using submerged uh, landscapes. Um, again, like I said, they would not be submerged in the past when these trees were alive. Um, and so we can start looking at um, how land and our coast has changed over time. Um, the way we do this, it's a lot of times, if you look at that, once you get your eye in, it's quite obvious that's a root system. If you can see, little stump roots. Um, but sometimes it can be quite difficult uh, to get your head around it. So um, we've got artist visualizations of what the landscape would have looked like. Pet level is quite spooky and cool. Um, but this is what it would have looked like before. This is the cliff in the back and um, beautiful woodland in the front. We didn't find any deer, sorry. 
Um, but we can use other um, examples from local flood memories, the recent past, to, uh, to make sense of these landscapes as well. This is um, uh, out in Woodbridge, I think, and we've got um, evidence of the 53 flood and how that even uh, sort of recent flood has affected the landscape. So you can see the process in action of these trees getting sucked up with salt water and dying and staying there. So you can sort of see how it would have gotten from a modern forest to sort of this submerged landscape, if that makes sense. But it's not just about telling, uh, it's about doing. Doing makes more sense for people. It's how people understand landscape. Um, and so here's some uh, fabulous uh, school kids we took out onto pet level. Um, so rather than just talking about sea level rise or, or landscape change, um, they get to actually explore it and see it. And so they were helping us record some of the stumps of trees. You can sort of see them there and there and there dotted about. Um, but it sort of helped them understand this different landscape and see it in a different way. Stosh. And of course our volunteers, our citizen scientists, so they're collecting data um, uh, day in and day out um, and coming up with their own theories about how uh, the coast has changed. Um, and so here's some amazing work that they were doing uh, and then just called us in for support. So here's a photo from 1976, we'll cast our minds back, um, uh, down on the, uh, the south coast um, at Beltouche. Um, I don't know if you can see, of course there's a line in the front of it. There's a little line here uh, amongst all these other lines. Um, we're gonna zoom in on it, uh, keep an eye on that. So it's um, a big uh, carved um, sort of shaft into the, into the um, chalk here. You can see the handholds here, little handholds that someone would have um, climbed up and down into the shaft to carve it. Um, so it's really visceral, really um, evocative. Uh, and then look, I don't know if probably you can't see it because of this desk, but there's little people <laughs> about this big, right on the coast, so on the shore. So you can get a sense of how big uh, this shaft is. Um, so this is in the 70s, uh, the picture was taken, and in, by 1982, um, the cliff had then eroded back again enough for it to go. It was gone. So we thought, well, what the heck, we've got these um, historic photos, let's see if we can find it again. It might, it might still be there. Right, the bottom of the shaft. And so some of our volunteers, our really keen volunteers um, who work for the natural, with the National Trust as well, um, decided to go every day uh, when they had the chance uh, to walk the, walk the beach and see if they could find this guy. Uh, and the, the wave cut platform down at the bottom here um, is covered with these huge rolling uh, uh, chalk boulders. Um, and if they roll around enough, you're not gonna see the bottom of it except in February 2016, um, they did. They found it. Uh, and that's only because they were out there every day, they knew what to look for, and they knew how, what to do when they found it. Um, so it's pretty awesome. And then you can start using this fixed point of archaeology to start um, getting, it's like a metric for the coastal change, right? So we know how much that cl cliff has changed um, since that day in 1976. Um, we have a picture of it. Um, little quote. Uh, so it's about inspiring people and getting involved and understanding uh, the risks to uh, archaeology but also to the to the coast. Um, but uh, climate change is uh, just a scary thing. Like I said, it's an agent of discovery. This was this summer. Everyone remembers this blazing summer that will never finish. <laughs> um, uh, it, it revealed amazing parchments all around the country and, uh, and in Ireland as well. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, so stuff like this, it's very difficult to see with these grids but um, you get to see lots of little circular patches here. Um, so potential um, ancient landscape behind one of the sea walls at Mersey. This was actually taken by one of our volunteers with, with their own drones. They just decided, well, well, we'll keep an eye out for things and see what happens. Um, so stuff like this is, um, is popping up. Very exciting. Um, and like I said, rapid recording important. So we've developed our little app. I'm gonna whiz through because I only have like one minute left. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> so um, hopefully you guys have all heard about the Citizen app is based on the um, one developed by uh, Sharp up in Scotland, and it helps people uh, collect data using a GPS and controlled forms and their uh, photos on their smartphone. So here's where everyone is. Check out that hotspot in London, you guys. Um, that's you guys. <laughs> um, so we've got 2,500 or nearly 2,600 app users to date, which is crazy. Um, and it gives you a little distribution of uh, where everyone's at. Um, 
Uh, so here's some of the new data we're getting. So it's about recording new sites that are revealed um, that weren't originally known about or uh, uh, from our baseline data set. So you can see some hotspots about new sites and mostly they're um, focused around areas that we as a citizen team are going and supporting our volunteers uh, looking at. But a nice little uh, warm spot on, uh, in London there as well. Um, so new features, mostly again, like I said, on our key sites here, but um, updated features, uh, because we use the TDP data set as part of our um, baseline for the app, um, huge hotspot on London there. And that's all you guys updating um, sort of frog sites as well. So that's, keep up the good work. <laughs> um, really awesome. And we've got, uh, yeah, so 2,300 uh, updated features um, talking about conditions of the sites and, and what, they're, what they look like now. Um, so I guess to sum up, uh, key takeaways, people, we, we asked people on our evaluation forms, did you enjoy it, would you come back? Most people said yes, hooray, <laughs> that's great news. Um, and if anyone's interested, I've got our evaluation report, you can uh, access that, we put up on our website. Um, and this is just a brag because <laughs> Gus doesn't just wear part of this suit. <laughs> So Gus does have a tuxedo, it's very exciting. Um, he was trying to wear his boiler suit and high vie to the um, award ceremony, but we wouldn't let him. Um, and, but this is just to say that uh, people, uh, we appreciate what you do and other people are noticing it as well. So just keep up the awesome work. Um, and uh, tomorrow, both TTP and Citizen are up for another award. So yay, keep, yeah, fingers crossed for everybody. Um, and what's next? Um, so we're just waiting. We've, we've actually spent most of the summer um, writing a new application to Heritage Lottery Fund. And um, keep your fingers crossed for that as well because we'll find out about that in December. So keep you guys updated. Thank you.